Hi, today we're answering some quote-unquote unanswered questions for Better Call Saul. These are questions I don't anticipate being answered by the end of the series, mostly just because I don't think they're overly relevant really. They were always meant to be things the audience fills in themselves. I've gotten a bunch of comments though on things like how Saul got the Black Book, or the Statue of Liberty, stuff like that. So today, that's what we're doing. We're filling in the gaps based on what we know and answering these questions. First off, how did Saul get the Vet's Black Book? The Black Book is the book that belongs to Caldera, the Vet, who acted as a middleman for many criminals, keeping all of their information inside of an encoded book. Saul first becomes aware of it in 606, Axe and Grind, when he buys the topical solution that dilates the pupils, used in the Howard scheme. Caldera tells Jimmy and Kim that he needs to sell his black book, or the keys to the kingdom as he puts it. This book later becoming very important to Saul, and probably the whole thing behind his I know a guy who knows a guy. Saul appears immediately impressed by the book, and sees it as the potential for passive income. When flicking through the book, Kim finds the card for best quality vacuum. Caldera also confesses in this scene that he's done with the criminal underworld, with it becoming too hot for him, and him wishing to pursue a career solely as a vet. Based on the best quality vacuum card within the book, we can presume he will start his new life by using the disappearer. Ed, just to make sure he leaves his criminal life completely behind. After the events of 607, it's confirmed that Saul will receive the Sandpiper settlement money, which is into the millions, this inevitably being enough to purchase the book, which Caldera has previously told him he wishes to sell. Due to there being no buyers either, he probably got quite a good deal for it. So simple. Saul then taking his place as a middleman, and the one with all the contacts. Next up, how did Saul get the Statue of Liberty? This one also seems fairly straightforward. After 602, Carrot and Stick, the Kettlemans are fearful of Jimmy and Kim. Personally, I think it's as simple as him going over there and buying it from them, and they accept it purely because they're afraid, but also they probably need the money. We know in Carrot and Stick that Jimmy did give them that money, and Jimmy does seem to genuinely like Craig to some extent, so I could see him paying a fair price for it. Probably not without some pushback from Betsy though. It could be a different blow up, but probably not. We know Saul took some inspiration from their tax business, and its very American or patriotic vibe. Not only does he take the statue, but he also uses the same waiting room music as them in Breaking Bad. Why did Saul's office change? This one is pretty much answered in the couple scenes we get of Francesca, adjusting to the new clientele Saul has taken on. We see her unhappily look on as they put cigarettes out on the sofas, pee in the fountain, and have their feet all over the furniture. She also appears generally threatened as they wield knives and whatnot. She basically seems to want some form of protection between herself and the clients, so she puts up the screen, and the furniture is traded out for more basic benches, probably because they're cheaper to replace, and they're a bit more durable. The one thing that does stay is the floor, which looks like linoleum or something, because it's probably easy to clean. In terms of the appearance of the columns and the constitution on the wall in Saul's actual office, this was more likely a result of what Kim said, naming Saul's new office a Cathedral of Justice. This along with the inspiration gained from the Kettlemans, and their patriotic side of things. And boom, you've got Saul's office. The wall was also likely replaced, so he could create a storage space for his hidden box that he retrieves in 405 quite a ride. We briefly see the sign Saul Goodman and Associates go up in 609, with it later being replaced by the Better Call Saul sign, the old sign sitting in his house. Again, this happened purely because of a change of branding. How did Saul figure out how the Disappearer worked? Saul seems somewhat uncertain on how Ed works when he introduces his services to Walt in Breaking Bad. Upon Saul's purchase of the Black Book, it's likely Caldera provided him with both a key to the book, but also one of Ed's cards, which was seen prior inside the book, explaining the service and also the required phrase, before confessing that he would be utilising Ed in order to escape his life as a middleman for criminals. And as far back as 403, Something Beautiful, he mentions in his current spot that the criminal world was getting to be too much for him. Caldera can likely pay the disappearance fee of $125,000, 
for the deluxe package. He probably has this amount already, and if not, I imagine the selling of the black book would help him reach this number. It's highly possible that the 20,000 Saul withdrew from the bank when faking the bribe photos could have been real, and could have been the amount he used to buy the book. Alternately, the $100,000 of cartel money that Saul received from Lalo for his bagman job may have been what was used instead, as legal use of that money may raise red flags. When and why did Saul buy the Cadillac? He got the Cadillac as a result of Kim's words to him in 601, saying that Saul drives something flashy and American-made. I think that's really just the answer. He likely had enough for it after receiving the settlement money, with a new Cadillac DeVille being about $40,000. What did Saul do with the Sandpiper settlement money? We've kind of covered this with some of the previous ones. The Black Book, the car, the Statue of Liberty, and redecoration of the offices, and then likely a large, or the main chunk of the money, was spent on his new house, with maybe some additional fees for commercials and stuff. The house may not have been so initially flashy, but we can presume it was added to over the years. Based on Saul's call in 611 with Francesca, he had plenty of money by the end of Breaking Bad, with one of his shell companies having 850k, along with additionally having nail salons, vending machines, and the laser tag place owned by Danny, as places to hide his money. He also seems to have over a million stashed in diamonds, or at least into multiple hundreds of thousands. Speaking of, how did Saul get the diamonds? These first appear in 101. This one we can actually make a pretty good guess at, based on the scene between Saul and Mike from 611. Mike discusses a Lasky with a high-end crew that fences jewellery up into Canada. Second story guy out of Indianapolis, Lasky. All right, part of a high-end crew fencing jewelry up into Canada. Nebraska is only a couple states away from the Canadian border, and so it's likely that Saul could have exchanged his cash for a more discreet package of diamonds from Lasky and his crew. It's also possible that he just had the diamonds prior. However, due to the absence of bags of money in the gene timeline, it seems probable he traded it for diamonds, until he begins earning money again from his identity theft scam in 611. Who were the people in the 601 intro? This has been up for debate, some saying they were people selling off Saul's items prior to his escape. This I don't buy because I doubt he could sell it in time before he flees unless the money was going to be funneled into one of the shell companies that were later seized. It's possible it was all being placed into evidence, or assessed for what should go in evidence for the police, his assets being locked up or likely liquidated. However, this also seems unlikely, with things like the Black Book being placed into having no worth. You'd think that would be analysed in some form, particularly due to the size of the case, unless that's more of a literal thing with it being a book. Who did Saul tell Francesca to call in 405 quite a ride and to tell them jimmy sent you what are you gonna tell them talk to my attorney yeah tell them uh jimmy sent you this one is essentially just pure speculation, but based on Francesca mentioning him in her call to Jean in 611, it was possibly Oakley. There's some problems here though. What with him being ADA at the time, and only supposedly switching sides post-breaking bad? So alternately we can assume it was a firm that Jean was aware of that he sent Francesca to the most likely being Davis and Maine. Cliff seems fairly indifferent to him at this point, so potentially he sends her to him, or Omar, if he's still with Davis and Maine. Schweikert and Coakley seems unlikely, being more focused on businesses it seems. A long shot could be someone like Ernie, possibly being a lawyer now, <laughs> or Christy Esposito. After all, it has to be someone who knows him by Jimmy, so knew him when he went by that name, and was friendly with him also. There's also someone like Erin, but I don't buy her helping at all. Why does Mike seem to hate Saul in Breaking Bad? Either I'm gonna leave, or I'm gonna put my foot in your skull. This was always a strange one to me, because it never seemed like Mike particularly liked him anyway. From the one scene of the two of them in the Breaking Bad era though, in Better Call Saul, it becomes pretty clear. They are great at assisting one another as criminals, but they don't exactly get along, or really need to, as long as they do the job that's required of them. Saul's interests are his own, and Mike's are largely Gus's at the end of the day. They're not always going to be on the same page. To each other, they are a means to an end. It's a functional business partnership, first and foremost. Alright, well that's gonna do it. 
Let me know if there's any more questions you'd like me to discuss, and please do drop your own thoughts in these questions too, and the possible answers they could have.